Hello everyone, welcome to the final episode of Focused Survival. This is it lads, the end is here, but worry not because I'll still make videos for 7 days to die, especially after Alpha 17 changes things. Normally I'd continue by saying that I welcome you to day 10, but in this episode we won't talk about that day. Just like episodes 8 and 9 where we focused on certain mid-game to late-game concepts, episode 10 is no different. Today we talk about base building, farming, electricity, and a few other concepts related to these three. Now before we begin discussing the main subject, let's talk about your first week. In order to survive, you probably took shelter in an abandoned cabin or a house, or you built your own small shack which you then reinforced to fight the ferals. This was but a stepping stone in your journey, a place that got you on your feet. What you do with it now is up to you. You can choose to stay there and build it up using the advice I'll share today, or you can move out. Where might be the question that plagues your mind? We have three possible answers to that question. You can build your base next to the trading outpost whose location was marked on your map, you can move to a settlement you saw in the distance but never visited, or you can search for a perfect place to build your base. Let's tackle this third answer. In order to be perfect, a zone should meet the following criteria. Firstly, there should be a settlement nearby so you can spend your days looting there. Secondly, a trader should be no further than a mile away. The closer the outpost, the better. Third, the terrain should be flat to decrease your workload. Fourth, the climate should be temperate to allow you to farm. Tundras and deserts won't do because the extreme weather there will hinder your progress. We'll talk more about weather survival later, for now let's stick with the list. Optionally, at number 5, there should be a desert and a wasteland no further than a mile away from your base. These biomes have important resources, but I say it's optional because once you have yourself a vehicle, you can just drive there regardless of distance. Last but not least, at number 6, you must have access to a water source, be it a lake or river, or even a tundra filled with snow. If you cannot find the perfect spot, make sure at least the first two criteria are met, because everything else can be improvised, although with much greater effort. Once you have decided where to go, you need to get ready. If you've chosen to visit a nearby settlement, you can first focus on acquiring a vehicle. You can use the sturdiest building there as a base of operations to protect yourself from the ferals when they attack. But your mission there is to scavenge buildings until you either find the bike parts or the schematic to build your own. But if you plan to build your base first and you found a nice place, mark it on your map and then prepare for a whole lot of resource gathering. Basically repeat the task of day 5 for about 3 days until you stockpile tons of wood, iron, clay and stone. Once you have enough materials, go to your designated spot and start building. I usually build a simple house in similar fashion to my first shack, but bigger. I always build my houses with a little elevation, like this, and then place stairs with railings to lead up to the door. This makes it harder for zombies to break in. As for the materials used in the construction, I use flagstone for the first floor, which I then upgrade to cobblestone as soon as I can. You can use bricks if you'd like, you can craft these in the forge, or you can build the structure out of concrete if you have access to a cement mixer and the required skill. The second floor is usually built just out of simple wood, there's no need to waste extra materials to protect a floor that's never attacked. As always I put my bedroll and storage boxes here on the second floor out of the reach of zombies and I usually keep the first floor empty and build arrow slits and firing ports so that I can fight attacking zombies from the comfort of my home. Of course, I also apply the principles of day 6 when upgrading this house and place spikes, barbed wire and pillars to help me defend against the first few hordes. And as I progress through the game and gain access to sturdier materials, I further upgrade my base. Before I build further upgrades though, I also designate a plot of land for farming. My next upgrade is a big wall built out of reinforced concrete. Depending on how many resources I have, the size of the wall can vary. For example, if I don't want to use a lot of materials, I only build this wall around my main structure and leave the farmland and everything else outside. But if you can afford it, you should wall off your entire settlement, the shelter, the garden, vehicle garage and whatever monuments to your greatness you may build. As I briefly mentioned, the wall should be built out of reinforced concrete. You can build it out of bricks or cobblestones and upgrade it to concrete later on, but that takes a whole lot more work than just building it with concrete from the get-go. Now that we're here, let me also quickly tell you how to build reinforced concrete. First, you use a forge to craft yourself rebar frames, which can be placed anywhere just like any other frame. Then you'll use the cement mixer to craft concrete mix, which you use to upgrade the rebar. After you pour the cement, it will be wet at first, and as such, it won't be very sturdy. If a horde attacks your wall before the concrete hardens, they'll easily tear through it. 
so don't build cement walls right before a feral horde if you can help it. One element I rarely see on walls are medieval castle defenses such as crenellations, which can be used as cover from spitter zombies and eventually bandits, and murder holes such as these which allow the user to shoot downwards on attacking hordes. But to be honest, medieval defenses are more aesthetic than practical. One actually practical defensive element that I urge you to build as soon as you can is the spike moat. The log spikes themselves can be built out of wood or scrap iron and they can be upgraded even with steel. The better they're upgraded, the higher their durability and damage they deal to zombies. As for the moat building, it is simple, especially if the terrain is flat. Basically, I dig a ditch 2 to 3 blocks deep and 2 blocks wide along the entire length of the wall. If you have to frequently take breaks to gather materials, it's better to cover this moat with wood frames, like you see here, to prevent zombies from falling in and digging under your wall. After the moat is done, remove the dirt from under the wall and extend the wall downwards, preferably with the same material. Once this is done, you can start placing the spikes and upgrade them as soon as possible. Place 4 spikes, upgrade them, place 4 more, upgrade those. Keep going until your moat is filled with spikes. Be careful not to fall in there, because that would just be ironic. To die in the defenses you built to stay alive. Anyway, if your wall and moat covers a larger area, zombies will get more dispersed and it will be harder for them to cause a breach. You can optionally build watchtowers around your walls to have an extended angle from which to shoot the zombies from. This is basically using the same principle of the pillars from day 6. Let's quickly recap everything about my building principles. Build a main structure, designate a spot for farming and build yourself a concrete wall either just around the main structure or around the entire lot. Then build a moat around the wall and place spikes. After you do this, feel free to build however many defensive items as you want, but keep in mind the fact that you will regularly have to maintain and repair your defenses after each attack in order for them not to fall. Anyway, this is all I had to say about the base. Let's also quickly have a word or two about weather survival. If you either suffer from a heat stroke or hypothermia, your speed decreases severely, your stamina degenerates rapidly, and eventually you can die, which is why you should always equip yourself appropriately for the type of weather you're in. Hot zones require you to wear cooling clothes, such as a poncho or a cowboy hat. You'll notice that these have negative insulation. You can also have a cool drink, such as a glass of yucca juice, or you can go for a swim. The wetness will reduce your core temperature. But reducing your temperature is a terrible idea if you're in cold weather. Here you'll have to build a fire, wear thick clothes and consume warm foods. I personally never had a problem in extreme weather because I'm always prepared for it. Now that we're done with that, let us talk about advanced defenses and discuss the electricity system. First let's have a word about electricity. This mechanic arrives later on in the game and in order to craft any electrical item you will need a workbench. We talked about the workbench on several occasions before so let's continue. For electricity to work you'll need three elements. Power generation, an object to be powered, and something to make the connection. There's also advanced systems, but we'll discuss these on another occasion. For now, it's best to stick with the basics. Power can be generated several ways. The most reliable of these is the generator bank. You can find the schematic to craft this yourself, or you can buy it from traders. You can then place the generator bank anywhere you'd like, just like any other block, and then you install small engines to generate the power. Fuel it up with some gas and turn it on whenever you want electricity. There's also battery banks and solar panels which don't require any fuels but have their own inherent limitations. But I'm more of a generator guy anyway, so let's stick with that. Now let's think of an object to power up. Because it's rather easy to craft and rather useful, we'll choose an electric fence pole for our experiment. Actually craft two of these. Place one not too far from the generator, and place the second not too far from the first. Third, we'll need to connect these with some wire, and for that we'll need the wire tool. Since it's a tool, you can find it in tool shops or whatever. If you're at the point in the game where you have a generator, you must have found one of these. Anyway, equip it and right-click the generator. After that, drag the wire to the first electric fence pole. If the pole is too far away, you can build an electric relay and use that as a middle point. You can build these relays to extend the wire as far as you'd like. But anyway, let's go back. Connect the generator to the first pole, then drag some more wire to the second pole. Power up the generator, find a zombie for your experiment, and if the zombie gets stuck in your fence and goes bzzzt, then congratulations, you are now an expert electrician. You can extend the electric fence with as many poles as you want, but you have to wire them in sequence. If you have, let's say for the sake of simplicity, four of these poles arranged in a square, your wire should go from generator to relay 
to pole number 1, to number 2, to 3 and then to 4. But what about 4 to 1? One side of our square is not wired and thus it's a gap in our defenses. If we try to take the wire to connect 1 to 4, the wire disconnects from 2 and now we got another gap. What we do in this situation is build pole number 5, take it near pole number 1 and connect it from the 4th. You should incorporate an electric fence in your defenses because it's a wonderful item. It doesn't deal a lot of damage to zombies but it keeps them still long enough for you to land a headshot. Another defensive item I wanted to discuss was the turret. You can craft an auto turret or a shotgun turret but it's easier to just purchase these from traders. Let's also assume that we don't want the turrets active at all time, only on horde nights. What do we do then? Well, to keep things simple, we'll use another generator. Place this generator, power it up and not too far off place a switch relay. Wire up the generator to the switch, wire the switch to however many relays you must put in between itself and the turret and then power up the generator and turn the switch on and off at your leisure. I also hope you have the right ammo for the turret, if so, load it up. There's only one more thing to do and that is to aim the turret where we want it to shoot. To do this you must click here on this display and use the turret's camera to aim it wherever you want. If you keep the wire tool in hand you'll see exactly where the turret is aiming and you'll also see the flow of energy through the wire to help you properly wire things in sequence. Anyway, once that's done you can have the generator running at all times but if the switch isn't on the turrets won't shoot. When Horde Knight comes, light it up. You can also position spotlights in the same way as the turrets using this display. Spotlights are pretty awesome light sources for your base defense. There's many other electrical items you can craft, from lights to alarms to traps, but I'll let you explore these yourself. For now we have only one more subject to discuss, and that is self-sustainability. The biggest gameplay element that defines this concept is farming. Because all plants in this game are heavily genetically modified, they mature in a few days instead of months, so once you have a farm, starvation becomes a thing of the past. Let me quickly explain the farming process to you. As I repeated several times throughout the video, it helps if the terrain is flat. If it is, you can start working the land. For that, you will need a hoe. You can use this hoe to remove the tall grass with left click and then use right click to till the dirt. Tilling the dirt with the hoe is considered upgrading the dirt blocks and you can further upgrade these and make the soil even more fertile by crafting or buying fertilizer. Once you've fertilized or at least tilled an area, you can take all the plants you've gathered and make seeds from them. You can make mushroom spores, corn seeds, coffee seeds, just to name a few. Once you have the seeds, place them in the tilled ground and just leave them to grow. Once they're fully grown, harvest them, turn a few of them into seeds and begin the process once again. One valuable seed is the one for the hop plant which can be brewed into life-saving beer. You can only purchase these from traders and you should place them in fertilized soil. For some reason if you apply fertilizer to your garden, whatever you place in that spot yields double the amount you'd normally get. I nearly forgot to mention that beer brewing is a skill that is acquired through educational material, only available at merchants, and it also requires specialized chemical equipment. Rewatch episode 3 to learn where to find this if you cannot craft it. One last thing that shouts self-sustainment is the ability to manufacture your own ammunition, and I don't just mean arrows and bolts, I mean bullets. Bullets have three parts to them. The bullet casing, made from brass you smelt in your forge, the gunpowder, which is best made at a chemistry station, and the actual lead projectile itself. Once you have all of these, you can use a workbench to assemble the bullets. You'll also need to unlock the appropriate perk for each of the bullets before you can start manufacturing them. Once you have all of these things, you'll have a chance against the increasingly more powerful feral hordes that want nothing more than to make you one of them. And once you have a base, it's always a good idea to fight the hordes, especially at later stages because you'll start finding all kinds of valuable military gear in their pockets. The best zombies you should always kill for good loot are the hazmat, the soldier, the puker and the white. They may not always be packing, but when they do, you've struck gold. But this was all I could teach you. If you apply all the knowledge I've shared with you along this series, you will not just be a mere survivor of the zombie apocalypse. You will be the zombies apocalypse, their worst nightmare. They shall all fall beneath you like wheat before a scythe and nothing will stand in your way. Except bandits when they're added to the game, I've heard those guys can be pretty badass. But until their arrival, there will be nothing to fear in the wasteland other than your shadow. And when you're a badass, maybe then I can count on you to save my life when we play this game together. But yeah, 
this was it for the series, guys. I hope you learned something or at least found it entertaining. And don't worry, there will be other videos. Some about 7 Days to Die, others about Kingdom Come Deliverance, my new favorite game. Maybe I'll even get to play Mount Bleed Bannerlord before 2020. It all remains to be seen. But yeah, I've been ranting long enough. It's time to say farewell. So, thank you again for watching this video and sticking by the series. And as always, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.